Okay, so um, you guys got two handouts today. Um, you turned in your first assignment today, which means, guess what? You get your second assignment. Remember, I said that I try hard in this class to keep it an even workload. So you just had an assignment, you turned it in, you get another one. And so we're going to kind of keep that trajectory going as we go forward. Um, for the most part, there might be a day or two where you don't have anything uh, floating around in the back of your head. But generally, you're going to. Um, I will spend a bunch of time next class. Remember, we don't have class on Monday because it's Labor Day. You get the day off. Excellent. Um, so long weekend, right? I won't be here. You can come if you want, but I won't be here. So it won't do you any good. Um, but on Wednesday of next week, I will go through a bunch of examples. And I'll talk about what makes these kinds of things work versus not work. And it's a lot about creating a realistic composition with realistic lighting effects and that sort of thing. And I'll talk through how we do that. We'll spend some time actually cutting people out next week. And then we'll talk about how do you integrate them into a, a scene and make them look like they belong in a scene. So we'll do a lot of collage work next week. Today, we're going to set the, 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 ground, the groundwork for what we're going to be doing next week. Um, because we're going to start doing a little bit of masking today, which is one of the more powerful things that you can actually do in Photoshop. And I want to kind of introduce you to the concept in a very kind of controlled way. Hopefully, today will be fun. You should play around with things. If the images turn out a little wacky, so what? Right? This is about learning some, some basic techniques. In the context of what we're going to be working on, I'm going to talk about two different things today. The first is called high dynamic range photography, which I talked a little bit about in the, the beginning lecture uh, of the class. Um, and when we first started talking about photography, I talked a little bit about it. Um, and I'll go into a little bit more depth so you can understand what it is and how it relates to the things that you'll be doing later on and why it's kind of a useful technique to begin with. And then we'll also talk about panoramic photography because sometimes you need to capture an image that just can't be captured with one image. So how do you stitch images together to create a bigger, um, more, more thorough view of a particular site or whatever? So let's start first with high dynamic range photography. I will refer to this both as high dynamic range photography and HDR photography. Um, so it's, it's a bit interchangeable. Essentially, what high dynamic range is, is it's a set of techniques that allow a greater dynamic range of luminances or light values between the lightest and darkest areas of an image. And so that's its technical definition. But let's talk a little bit more in depth about it. It's these kinds of images that we're talking about. So we're going to take three separate images. And, and like I said, I, I went through this a little bit more. I showed you this, or I talked through this example before, but I'll, I'll repeat myself here. We, we take an image that's properly exposed for this particular scene. We take an image that's deliberately underexposed and an image that's deliberately overexposed. So in this context, we have our three images. We have our dark image that has the, the underexposed sections where the shadows are too dark to see anything. We have our middle image that's the correct exposure of an image. And then we have our light image that gets the highlights, but a lot of the sky and everything is blown out in that sort of an image. And we're going to combine those three images together into one image. That's how we get that greater dynamic range. And really what this is about fundamentally is it's a way of trying to see in print form or in, in single image form what our eyes and our brain can do naturally. We, with human eyes, have the ability to process images really fast. And so if right now, for example, you look down at your feet in the shadows, and then you quickly look up and look out outside, it's not too bright. You can still see everything that's outside. Now, the older we get, the longer it takes for our eyes to adjust. So I'm starting to notice that too. I actually I remember um, uh, my dad talking about um, when I was in high school and uh, I was playing basketball and whatever, and he said it was always really hard when he'd go from outside to come into the gym because he couldn't see anymore. And I was like, yeah, whatever, you're just old, right? Uh, typical high school kid, right? Well, now guess what? <laughs> I'm having the same problem. <laughs> I walk in and it's like, wow, I can't see a thing, right? So the point is that our eyes take a little bit longer to adjust, but for those of you that are young, you don't have to worry about this just yet. It hasn't happened to you, but we see in high dynamic range because our brains and our eyes can process and change so fast that we can see what's dark, we can see what's light, and it doesn't take us any time to adjust. And so that's how we see the world. When we take a single image as a photograph, though, that image is captured forever at a particular exposure, and it looks a particular way. 
So we can't go back in and dynamically change what we're seeing. It doesn't work the same because it's printed. It's still. And so when we talk about high dynamic range, essentially what we're trying to do is mimic the way we see the world. It's not static. It's moving. So we're going to combine those together. And we're going to do that um, by representing a large variety of light values in a single image. The other big reason, and there's a couple of you that were in 136 or have taken 136 or are concurrently in 136. We haven't quite gotten there yet, but there's another big reason that HDR images are important, and that is in rendering. And so if I'm looking at uh, creating a rendering in, in Rhino and in V-Ray, and I want there to be sky in the background, Rhino and V-Ray have the ability to change the camera exposure to whatever you want it to be. So I can go in there and say, I want the shutter speed to be this and the aperture to be that. Render me an image. Well, the background image, the sky, has to be able to change based on what the settings are in the rendering engine. So we create a very special background file called an HDRI, a high dynamic range image, that works as our background that will dynamically change lighting conditions based on what the rendering engine needs. So it is extraordinarily useful when we get into the rendering end of things. So you do 3D modeling, you do rendering, high dynamic range is critical for that. You can, if you have enough knowledge, create your own high dynamic range image as a background for your renderings. It takes a little bit of work. Tone mapping is what we use that kind of strips down the true high dynamic range image that contains all the bit information, the color information, into something that we can see or that we can look at. So the images that I'm showing you, when I take those three images and I combine together, they inherently have been tone mapped, which is a way of letting us see what we would see in real life with our eyes. And so in this case, it can be, be uh, <laughs> sometimes it just, your tongue gets tied, right? It can be applied to produce a variety of effects. Sometimes it's about realistic effects. Sometimes it's about artistic effects. Sometimes it's even beyond the artistic in terms of how far you push this. And I'm going to show you a bunch of examples so that hopefully this starts to make sense. What we're effectively doing is we're reducing the dynamic range of the overall image, but we're keeping a contrast ratio in the localized pixels. So if we look between dark and light in one area, there's always still a contrast. But this dark and light is different than a dark and light somewhere else in the image. So we're going through the image and changing which parts of the image have that contrast. So nothing's too light and nothing's too dark. So we get this combination. So let's talk about software choices. Most obvious one, we're in class to learn Photoshop. It would be really sad if Photoshop wasn't here as part of it. This is what we're going to do today as part of your exercise 106. And that is that we're going to create this high dynamic range image from three separate images. I asked you in exercise 103 to try to take your own set of images. Remember, it was called a bracketed set of images. If you didn't, or if those don't work, I've got a bunch of samples that you can work from. So you don't have to have your own image, but sometimes it's fun to try on your own image. The cool thing about it in Photoshop is this whole process is automated. It's as simple as clicking a button and saying, merge these to high dynamic range image. It's pretty easy. There's a few toggle switches along the way. After we get the merge to HDR, then we're going to do post-processing on the image. We're going to do the same techniques that we've worked on previously with our adjustment layers and our blending modes. We'll do the same stuff that we've been doing, but we will also apply it to special pieces of the image using masking. And I'll talk you through that in a little bit. There is no built-in tone mapping for Photoshop. You have to do it manually. So it's not going to just create this beautiful image from the start. You have to do a little bit of work on your end. And that's, that's uh, you know, to be expected as part of Photoshop. Uh, it is, of course, available on the, all the lab computers. If you have um, the Creative Cloud on your laptop or whatever, you can do it there as well. There is another software program called Photomatix that I at least like to bring up and point out. Uh, what Photomatix is, is it's a standalone application, though they do make a plug-in for Lightroom if you're a professional photographer. But it's this standalone application that does an even better job of tone mapping images and post-processing high dynamic range images. It's pretty easy to use. It varies if you have the, the lower end version. I think it's about 40 bucks. If you have the higher end version, it's like 100. Um, and if you were really into this, you might go buy it because it's better and faster at doing it than doing it manually. 
Uh, but I at least like to introduce it as this is the, the kind of the gold standard if you're into this sort of thing. If you were a real estate photographer taking real estate pictures all the time, using something like this would be really good. And I'll show you a few examples of that a little bit later on in the, uh, in the lecture. So let's go through a bunch of examples, because I think the easiest way of understanding what tone mapped high dynamic range images look like is to see examples. And so why might they be important? I told you briefly that sometimes people want to use these if they're in the real estate field. If you're buying or selling a house, you're renting an apartment, you go on Craigslist and you're looking for an apartment and you're looking at the pictures, sometimes you get images that look like this on the top. Okay, I have a great sense of what this space looks like. Okay, this is pretty cool, but I have no idea what it's looking at because all of the windows are completely white. And so the same thing would happen if I was standing in this room and I exposed for the room so we could see the whole computer lab. We wouldn't see anything outside of those windows because they'd be all too light. So if you were trying to sell this as a space to rent or a space to buy or something like that, you would want to show people instead of the white background, you'd want to say, oh, look, I've got this whole city view. It's high up in the building. I've got a great view. You want to show that. And you can do that using a high dynamic range image because you're processing both. So here's some more examples of, of real estate photography here. We have the standard photos on the left, and we have the high dynamic range photos on the right. I think this one down here is, is probably the, the most obvious one to try to understand what's happening here. This is our standard exposure. We get blown out sky. We can tell that there's a little bit of a view. But if you were trying to buy or rent this particular place, would you be more attracted to this one on the left, or would you be more attracted to this? Right? You'd like this one. No surprise, because we're seeing what's inside and what's outside. And so we can use this technique for those kinds of things. So you, in the design field, you're going to have to think about how do I showcase what it is that I'm trying to do. And this is a technique that certainly makes it a little bit better. So I'll flip so through some more examples. Sometimes it looks like a normal photograph. Something like this looks very normal, nothing particularly special, except that there's a little bit more detail down in the shadows than there otherwise would be. And so that's a very realistic high dynamic range photo. They didn't, they didn't exaggerate anything. It's great for nighttime or dusk shots because we can get a lot of depth out of the shadows, but we also get all the lights in the building. It would be very easy to photograph this scene and have just the lights and everything else be black. Likewise, we could photograph the scene and have everything else exposed nicely, but the lights not really showing or too bright. So we're doing this as a way of making a better image as a whole. Another example here, we're seeing more depth in the shadows. I like this one because it shows some of the problems that can happen. So if we look, everything above this line looks great. Or at least we could argue it looks great. But if we look down here at the traffic, remember I'm compiling this image from three separate images, maybe five images, maybe seven images. But when I shoot multiple images, objects that move through space end up having problems. So I sh I'm sitting here, I take this shot, one, two, three, even if they're quick succession, we get things like double license plates. Right? We get things like headless people. Those sorts of things happen in these kinds of images because we're combining three different images together. They're not exactly the same. So anything that moves, we're going to end up having some trouble. And so we have to compensate for that um, or be aware that it can happen, at least. Another example here. I'm just going to kind of flip through these. Great for sunsets. So I showed you the realistic examples. Those all qualified as realistic. We can get into the artistic side, or surrealistic, rather easily with tone mapping. And so this ends up being a lot, lot more about mood. 
right? The colors tend to glow a little bit more. It has a, a fuzzy quality to it. And we can certainly get this result. Sometimes this is desired. I really like this image. I think it's a fantastic image, but it's not quite a true photograph. It's not quite crisp enough to be a true photograph. We can tell that there's been some post-processing over it. We could take it a step further. I like this one as well. This is a very like haunted, old, abandoned house sort of thing. But the sky wasn't really that dark. It didn't really have those black clouds. They were probably dark gray, but they weren't quite like this. You know, the, the halo, yeah, we've got some sun shadows. I mean, you know, it's, it's overdone a little bit. Still nice image. Still nicely composed, but it's a little overdone. So this is pushing into the artistic side of things. Another example here. It's almost getting painterly in its quality. So it's just it's pushing the envelope a little bit. And that's not to say that these are bad. It just shows you that you can really start to push this. Now we can push it a little bit further. Right, you see I'm kind of escalating up in how much these are, these are done. If I was actually looking at the Golden Gate Bridge, I would highly doubt that this is what it looked like. So this is not a, a true photograph anymore. It's an artistic representation of something. And so it's important to recognize that you can push this boundary maybe a little bit too far. Here's an example of a high dynamic range coupled with a panoramic photo. So we're going to talk about panoramic photos in just a second. But essentially what this is is if I were to take this and cut it out and put the left edge around and hook it onto the right edge, it would go around in a circle. Furthermore, this would come down to the bottom and that would come down to the top. So it would be perfectly projected on the inside of a sphere. And this is what we would use for rendering, for example, because it goes all the way around the object that we're rendering. Another example here, colors are a little bit oversaturated. If we look at the actual wood decking, it's, it's too much. It's a little too far. A lot of times you can tell when the post-processing has gone a little far by the clouds. Clouds are just pushed a little bit beyond. So let's shift a little bit from high dynamic range into panoramic photography, which we will do this as well today. And essentially what a panorama is, is it's a very wide view of a particular space. And we've all kind of become more and more familiar with these because they're built into our phones now. You know, you can stand there and you can do this. And you can take the big panorama. Um, it's getting really easy to take panoramas. It used to be a lot harder to do it. In the old days, people would actually draw what's going on in a particular scene all the way around. If it's a 360 panorama, it just means it's all the way around. So we can have a panorama that's just wide. Our phones naturally, or at least iPhones naturally, take 180 degrees. They don't take the full 360. But a full 360 goes all the way around. If it is full, it also should go 360 up and all the way around that way as well. Much harder to do. So in the old days, when we had to stitch images together, and you'll still end up doing this over time when we didn't have the iPhone strategy, we would take a bunch of images, we'd, we'd shoot those images, and we'd combine them together and then use a software program to unroll them, essentially. And so this is a kind of an example of how these images go together. We've got the camera in the center. We're taking all these images that overlap. And generally speaking, you want to overlap the images by about a third. That gives you a lot of overlap, and it's easy to stitch the images together. If you have just barely a little bit on the edges, it's much harder to stitch the images together. No surprise. So lots of images. In, in the case of a full 360 panorama, you're probably looking 50 images or so that are going to be stitched together. We've actually gotten to the point where some people are processing what they call gigapixel images, where they take a panorama and they process, you know, they, they shoot at a telephoto length and they shoot hundreds of photos and stitch them together. So we have this giant, really big file that has a huge amount of detail in it, uh, which can be kind of interesting. Let's talk about mechanics just a little bit. When we're shooting it, if we're shooting with our iPhone, right, we, we automatically do this, because that's how the iPhone's set up. Right? And my guess is if you're on an Android phone, it's the same. Okay? But the problem with this, and, and the, the, the processor in the iPhone kind of corrects for this, but if we're going to do the same thing with an actual physical camera, 
we're going to take individual shots, and we go like this and like this and like this as we're taking our pictures. What happens is that objects that are in line going backwards. So let's say I had somebody standing right here. I had somebody standing in the middle of the classroom, and I had somebody standing in the back of the classroom. When I come around and I take a picture, this first picture, I see those three people in a line over here, and they're, they're going to appear kind of out, of out of alignment because I'm looking out the side angle of my lens. When I turn my camera and I take this shot, all three people are obviously going to be in perfect alignment. And when I take this shot, they're going to be out of alignment again. So if I swing the camera around that way, I'm going to get problems. It's called parallax. And I'll show you some examples of parallax in a bit. That's a problem when we're stitching the images together. If you, have you guys looked at Street View before in Google, right? right? You pull up some destination and whatever. And there's like telephone poles, and the wires kind of hang out, and they don't quite match. That's, that's parallax. That's exactly what I'm talking about, where the things don't stitch together. If, however, instead of moving the camera in position, we keep the camera isolated around the point in the lens where the image goes upside down. If we isolate the camera around that point and we spin the camera, we eliminate this problem. So what we do is we isolate the center of the camera this way. We isolate the center of the lens where it flips upside down, both in horizontal and if we're swinging the lens. And that then allows us to isolate these objects. So here's the, the the actual diagram. We've got an object in the foreground. We've got an object in the background. We shoot straight at those two objects. They line up straight. If the camera doesn't isolate around the nodal point, we end up with one object here and one object here when they're not actually, they look like they're not in line. If we isolate the nodal point, pull the camera back, isolate the nodal point, as we swing the lens, these stay in alignment. And therefore, we don't get the parallax errors, which is the whole point. So here we go. Here's the examples of the parallax errors. Power lines always end up with parallax errors. They're, they're really challenging. They're thin and hard, but we get those kinds of, of problems. right? Something like this, line on the side here, they don't quite match up. Those are the kinds of things that I'm talking about that we can solve by just how we take the image. There we go. There's a few more parallaxing problems. We have pieces of the building that don't quite line up jumps, et cetera. And that, that kind of destroys the final result, because we're distracted, because they didn't really stitch together correctly. So we have two different things. One, we can get an unrolled image, image out of this. So we can fold it out and see it as an unrolled image. The other thing is we can do an interactive viewer. So we can scroll around and see what's going on in a particular scene, which can be kind of fun if you're visiting, quote, visiting virtually to a different place. Yeah. I'll show you one that I shot by hand uh, a little bit later on. I got, by the way, I should, I should clarify, my, most of my grad thesis was on panoramic photography and the, the translation to architecture. So I spent a lot of time studying this in like 2006, 2007. So technology's changed quite a bit since then. Um, but in that time frame, you did shoot with a tripod. And ideally, you shot with a, um, a click stop tripod mount that stops at given degrees as you go around. And you, we also we built a, um, a bracket that held the camera in the correct positioning. So you could swing vertically or horizontally and isolate that nodal point. Um, so it takes a lot of work. But if you understand the mechanics of it, you can shoot manually. You just have to move around the camera instead of the camera moving in front of you. So the natural thing is you swing the camera. Instead, if you, if you had the camera, this is not a you know, good example, instead of doing this, I would do this and try to keep that in the same place. It's a little bit harder. So we could end up with the interactive viewer, which of course you've seen on websites. I'll show you an example of that a little bit later. So how do we stitch these image to images together in the first place? Well, obviously, this is a Photoshop class. Guess what? We're going to use Photoshop. It's really good. Photoshop's awesome at small groups of images. Nine images, 10 images, great. If you throw 40 images at it, mm, probably not going to turn out so well. Um, so it is an automated process, just like the merge to HDR that we talked about earlier. Uh, if you're trying to stitch a full 360 panorama, it's pretty tough. 
Um, it, it gets kind of cranky. And, and you guys will experience that uh, through a variety of examples. As part of your exercise 106 today, I have sample um, photos that you can download that are full panoramas if you want to try to stitch that stuff together. Otherwise, I asked you to shoot some that overlapped. You'll try to stitch those together. Um, there's a couple other programs that are based on uh, a, a software called Pano Tools, which is a command line. These are graphic interfaces for them. PT GUI is one. It's, it's out of the Netherlands. Um, it's a very robust, very good at stitching images together. You can actually look at two images side by side and pick this point is the same as that point, and it'll warp the image to match as you stitch them together. They're very, it's very cool, very robust, but it costs a little bit of money, you can see, uh, to get it if you want to get it. Huggin, however, is an open source free version of the same software. So if you want to mess around with panoramas, Huggin is great because it's free. It works on Mac, it works on Windows, it works on Linux too. Um, so you can download it and you can mess around with it. It's great. Same thing, you can assign control points. This point in this image is the same as that point in that image. It will go through and, and naturally process where it thinks the control points are. You can make adjustments. It's really, really good. It used to be installed on the lab computers and then they took it off. So I used to actually do a little bit with it, but they decided that they didn't want to support it anymore. So anyway, you don't get to do it. But if you want to do it at home, you can of course download it. It's free. Uh, so I like to at least point that out if you get really into panoramas. Google Street View is available on the iPhone. It's also available, obviously, on Android phones. Um, this is kind of like the Panorama app, except you can actually take 360 panoramas. It works great outside. It does a great job of stitching, especially if you think about moving yourself around your phone instead of your phone around yourself. Um, and you can, you can end up getting great views. It's also kind of fun, because if you're going someplace, you can actually look at stuff that people have have taken. Um, I got a notice about a month ago. Uh, out of the blue, I got a notice from Google. Congratulations, your Street View photo reached 50,000 views. I'm like, what? Well, when I was messing around with this stuff, I don't know, three, four years ago, I, I happened to be in Hawaii and I took a picture on the beach. And I was like, oh, this will be fun. And I took it. Forgot all about it, uploaded it, and whatever. What well, was that photo that got 50,000 views? Kind of weird, you know? It's like, why didn't I get like a penny for every time somebody viewed it? But I didn't. So, anyway, um, interior panoramas, though, meh, not so good. Uh, the problem with that is it's really hard to isolate that nodal point. And if you've got a lot of, like, if we look at this room, for example, look at all the parallel lines that are running across the ceiling in both directions. It's going to be really hard to get all of those to stitch up and look right as this sort of thing. But it's free, so you can, you can certainly download it and play around with it. So the other thing that's happening a lot more now is something called 360 video. And you may or may not have experience with this. We've talked about trying to integrate it into the history classes here at DVC. I think it's something that's coming, certainly. Uh, essentially, what it is is you can use your phone or some kind of a device in some kind of a set of goggles. And there's, there's stuff all the way from cardboard to really expensive hardware that you can put around your head. Uh, and what your phone does is it splits your image into two images, so each eye is seeing a different image that's slightly different. Uh, and as you look around, it uses the sensors in your camera to know you're looking around, and you can actually see the full 360 video of what's going on. So not only do you get playback of what's happening live, but you're also seeing whatever you want to see in that particular video. It's a pretty cool idea. Uh, and it's certainly something that's been floated for a long time, but the technology hasn't really been there. We're getting to the point where the technology is kind of there. And so I would imagine you'll start to see it a lot more. I think um, there are a few TV shows that are starting to film certain scenes in 3D so that you can actually watch those scenes in 3D where you're actually in the middle of what's happening. Oh yeah, the, the, they're like stereolithography or it's like STL images or something where you have one of each and it makes things more 3D. So anyway, we're, we're getting that way. And so I like to at least introduce it as this is something that's coming. You'll probably start to see it a lot more. They actually make video cameras now that shoot 3D or 360 video. Um, it's, it's essentially like a ball that has a lot of cameras on it. I've seen it done with GoPros where it's like five GoPros that are filming all at the same time. And then they stitch those images together to make the final video. It's pretty cool. Um, and we're getting there. So I like, at least like to point it out that it's coming. So let's look at some examples. 
like I said, I got really into this when I was uh, an undergrad, and then I carried it on into grad school. So I have lots and lots of images. I'm just going to throw a bunch up here for you. Uh, this is that, that mud dwelling in Peru that I talked about uh, before. I like this image because it shows you that your exposure really matters when you're shooting a set of images. If you let the camera auto sense the, the, the exposure, you could end up with an image that's darker than the others. So I had one image in this bunch that was, that was shot of the sky that ended up the exposure was wrong and it was too dark, and it creates an artifact in the overall image. Now, of course, I could go back in and touch that up in Photoshop and make it go away using a clone stamp or whatever. But in this context, I wanted to show you that exposure does matter. I have another example of Worcester Hall that you'll, you'll see a little bit later where the uh, exposure is off. Um, if, you, if you stitch a bunch of images together, but you don't take the full 360 up and down, you'll end up with these scalloped edges along the bottom. Another example here, the scalloped edges have been cut off, but you get a really wide view of what's happening in a particular scene. Sometimes you miss an image. See there's a hole in the upper right corner. I missed that shot. And I was counting my images going around, taking all the images. I skipped it by accident. And so you end up with a hole. So the other thing about these kinds of photographs is things that are straight, when you unroll them, turn curved. Things that are curved turn straight. So as we look at this image, it's a full 360 image, we see a bunch of parallel walls. What do those look like in reality? They're not straight. They're curves. This was right in the center of Mirai. So we shot it right there. So uh, this is a really good example of what's curved become straight, what's straight become curved. Um, and so anyway, that was, that was a good example of that sort of thing. This is a set of images that I'll actually give you to play with today. Um, this is in Ollantaytambo, Peru, up in a, uh, an old ruin looking out across at some of the other ruins through the door. It's a high density image. There's lots of images. I think there's maybe 50 something images that you can stitch together to make this particular image. I also have the 360 version of this so you can see that live as well. More examples here. Oh, let me come back here. Sometimes you make little mistakes. There's somebody's shoes. Mm -hmm. Whoops. It happens. So this was actually, this is one of my favorite images. Uh, it was in the old Amtrak stain, train station in Oakland. Um, and it shows people moving through the space. I was able to ghost these. And this is the actual image that spawned the bulk of my thesis. This was, I was like obsessed with this image. So anyway, I had to show you that image. If you move on to Berkeley, you're going to spend an awful lot of time here. This is the architecture building at Berkeley out in the courtyard. Um, they've since added on uh, a big th 3D fabrication lab thing here. So it's changed a little bit. But I like this one as well because you see the exposure problem. So I, when I shot the exposure, I had a problem in this upper corner. And while the other one in the sky up here, it's easy to fix. A little clone stamp, you can make that go away. When your image crosses across the building and we get this darker section of the upper part of the building, you can't fix that afterward. So you really want to pay attention to that exposure as you're taking the images themselves. Here it is at night, same building at night. This is probably most of what you'll see of this building. <laughs> we, love, we love the nighttime. Um, so you know, interestingly, sorry, we're going to tell a little Berkeley Worcester story. Um, so the tower which is where all the studios are. On every floor, there's, there's, there's studios. Every light in the tower is on a motion sensor. So if nobody's on the floor, the lights go off. No surprise. Energy saving, right? So it's always a little bit of a competition to see which lights never go off. And so it's kind of fun, right? So as you go up in the tower, and in the, in the lower floors, you've got like the, the, the city planning people, and you've got the landscape people. And you know, maybe about 10 o'clock, those lights go off. You know, whatever. They don't stay up as late as we do. So then, then you get the, like maybe the fifth floor is the, the, you know, the earlier studio people, and, and their lights tend to go off about midnight. Right? Then you start creeping up into the eighth floor, and then you get to the ninth floor, which is the top floor. And that's the grad studio. That's where all the thesis people are. Those lights never go off. No way. Those lights do not go off. 
is kind of entertaining. So if you ever go in there at night, look up at the tower, and you can see. You can see who's working. Kind of fun. I'm not saying that to scare you. It's totally worth it, I promise. So the other thing about multiple exposures, remember you're taking lots and lots of images, you can end up seeing people move in a sense of images. So we did this one as a fun example. We were teaching a, a seminar uh, after we graduated on panoramic photography, and so we were goofing around with it, and we took ourselves, took pictures of ourselves in every picture. And so you see multiple versions of me and multiple versions of my friend just being goofballs, but it shows you that when you're taking multiple images, you can do this kind of thing. So we ended up showing up a bunch of times. That's back when I had more hair. So here's another example. It was in a small space. We were looking at this old Soyuz capsule uh, at the Chabot um, Space and Science Center. We were in a back room. You can see it's full of junk and whatever, but it's kind of fun. Uh, and I was taking a panorama so we could kind of capture what we were doing in this. We were laser scanning the, the, the capsule and whatever. And this is a great example here of, I wasn't really paying attention as I, as I took the images. And here, as I swung through the center images, I, no problem, I took the center images. And then when I did the lower set of images, there's a half a person, just the person's legs sitting there because they walked in front of the camera as I, as I took the shot. So it happens. It's not particularly noticeable, but it, it, is, it is certainly there. Uh, just more examples. So I told you I'd get to a handheld set. And so this was on the Brooklyn Bridge in New York. Um, I didn't have my tripod with me. Uh, I didn't want to carry it on that trip. And I wanted to take a panorama of the people walking on the bridge and that sort of thing. So I actually shot this one by hand by setting myself up with my camera and then moving, trying to keep the camera in the same spot as I worked my way around and took all of the images. So if you understand that principle, you can do it. Notice though, it's not going full 360 vertical. It's just one stretch across the horizontal. It's much easier to do one stretch across the horizontal than to try to take pictures of the sky and, and whatever. For that, you really need a tripod. It was at least 12, I'm trying to think. I don't know, it's been a while. I can go back and look, because um, I still have the images. This is out in um, Alameda at the naval base. Some more examples. It's quite entertaining to look at all these pictures, because this is before I had kids, so I actually had time to do this sort of thing. <laughs> now, now my panorama tripod and all that stuff sits under the bed and has dust all over it, because I never take it out anymore. But it's kind of, you know, that's, that's the nature of life. I'll get back into it at some point. Sometimes you can get goofy with the, the end results, uh, which can be entertaining as well. These are a bunch of the uh, San Francisco International Airport. I ended up doing my thesis uh, relating to an airport. Um, so these are a bunch of the, the panoramas that I shot relating to the airport. So I'm flipping through. So then I started to do these drawings that were in 360. And then I had to teach myself how do you actually draw a 360 degree perspective. So how do you, how do you unwarp this sort of thing? And you're essentially passing through a curving lens and that. It's, it took, quite a bit to be able to draw these things. This was a piece of one of my final drawings. This drawing ended up, I think, being 23 feet long. It was backlit, had a bunch of silhouettes on it and whatever. It was a really cool drawing um, that I don't even know where it is anymore, but such is life, right? 10 years later. Um, but anyway, I had to teach myself how to draw these kinds of things. Anybody drawn two point or three point perspective before? Right, it's challenging, right? So this is drawing it, but it's spherical. Everything's curving. So anyway, it was, it was fun. But this is a lot of what my uh, thesis revolved around. So let's move from the examples here. There's, there's one of the final images there. So let's move from the sample images over into our exercise 106. Uh, let's take about a 10 minute break while I get started and set up here. Um, so come back at 9.03, and then we'll, uh, we'll continue on with our processing. If you haven't given me your printed version of your final photo. I would like that by the end of class today. You should have already posted your um, assignment to the course website. That's why uh, pirates wear eye patches. I saw on pirate tent. It was, it's not because they're blind, it's because they're
Okay, so we're going to uh, start up with exercise 106, uh, and I'm going to walk you through how to create the HDR images. Um, and we're going to start with that first, and then we'll get into the panoramic images as we go forward. Remember, part of what we're going to talk about today is um, how do we do selective masking in certain ways to make our adjustments apply to specific parts of an image. Um, so when we, when we get started here, if you have your own three images that you shot bracketed, one deliberately underexposed, one correctly exposed, one exposed, uh, overexposed, that's great. Use your own images. You'll get more out of it if you use your own images. But sometimes they didn't work out, or you couldn't figure out how to do it on your camera, or what have you in exercise 103. So in that case, if you go to today's exercise 106, and you scroll to the bottom here, I have zip files of HDR samples, group 1, group 2, and group 3. Uh, all three of them are different. They were images that I shot on a variety of, uh, of, of places here. Um, let me go back to, here we go, just for perspective. No, that wasn't what I wanted. I'll show you what they are. Uh, so I, I have this one, which you guys saw before, which is the, uh, you gotta love it when stuff doesn't fit, right? Let me just open it in Photoshop so you guys can see it here. So it's this, it's this uh, sunset one, so you can work on that. I also included, it's great when my computer crashes too. All right, hold on. <laughs> Try that one more time here. So here's an image shot from the top of Half Dome looking down at Yosemite Valley. I know these are the underexposed ones, so you're, you're not getting the best view here, but that's essentially the whole process of doing this. Uh, and then I also have one that's up in Desolation Wilderness. If you're a hiker, uh, it's up by Lake Tahoe. Uh, another example here of, of kind of a stormy scene. Anyway, I'm going to use those images to create uh, a high dynamic range image. So let me go ahead and, and walk you through the process. It's actually very, very easy. Uh, to do this. This is written out in Photoshop 1.8 if you want to follow along that way as well. But essentially what we're going to do is we're going to go to the File menu and we're going to go to the Automate menu and we're going to come down to Merge to HDR Pro. That's what we're picking. Uh, it's an automatic process in Photoshop, which is great. When I click on Merge to HDR Pro, it brings up the Find Your Source File images. So the, you need to have downloaded them or found them on your hard drive. And you, they need to be decom decompressed so that they're actual image files. They can't be within the zip file itself. Um, let me go to Browse, and I'm going to go find those. And um, it doesn't really matter which group I pick. I'm going to pick the Half Dome ones for right now. I'm going to click on the first one, uh, hold down Shift, and click on the last one so I get all three of the images. Remember, there should be three images. I'll say OK, and they load up here, 26, 27, 28. I shot them in order. No surprise, they're in order here. We do want to make sure that we check the box for attempt to automatically align source images. There may be subtle variations in the shot, and Photoshop will attempt to, to line them up based on content. And I'll go ahead and say OK at this point. And Photoshop, you can see over here in the layer stack, if you watch the layer stack, it's going to start loading up various pieces and providing a bunch of automatic options for us, which is good. That then gives us this HDR Pro preview window here. And in this view, we can see what our three images are down here at the bottom. This has an exposure value of plus 2.0. This has an exposure value of 0, so that was the one that the camera thought was right. And this has an exposure value of minus 1.99. So that was what my camera determined when I shot this. Um, we're going to come over here to the options. And we can look through a bunch of the 
presets, which I'm always a fan of at least trying out the presets a little bit so you can see what happens. If we do photorealistic, for example, it tweaks the image just a little bit. We get fairly good results. Um, we could try photorealistic high contrast. We could try photorealistic low contrast to see which one kind of looks best. Uh, we could come here, notice there's a surrealistic high contrast. That might be too much. We could do saturated. The point is, play around with the various options and decide what feels about right. We can also come down into the manual options. Notice that every time I change the default presets here, uh, these various sliders change. You're more than welcome to play around with it. I've had some luck with the curves doing a traditional S curve. So pulling that up a little bit and pulling that down a little bit can help. In this case, it overrode the preset. And I don't think it looks any better than the preset. So I'm going to go back to the preset, uh, which I think was saturated. I think that was the one that I liked the best. And when I'm done, I'll go ahead and say OK. And when it's, when it's done with its processing, essentially it's giving me one high dynamic range image to work with. So it took those three and combined them together. I'm going to do the same thing over again on the other photos. You're only doing one, so you don't have to do multiple. But in the interest of teaching you how to do it, sometimes repetition is a good thing. So I'm going to go ahead and go to File. And again, I'm going to go to Automate. And I'm going to choose Merge to HDR Pro. I'm going to choose my files. Uh, if you right click on the zip archive itself and say extract files, okay. mm -hmm. extract all, sorry. So attempt to automatically align source images. Yep, 16, 17, and 18. We'll go ahead and say OK. So the nice thing is that we don't really have to do anything while it's doing its processing. OK, so once again, I get back here. We'll look through what our various options are. That's ugly. So in this case, I'm not really finding anything. So I'm going to try the curve adjustment here. Pull this over just a bit. The, the, the way that I was, I'm essentially doing a levels adjustment at the same time. I tweak those top and bottoms over. So anyway, up there it doesn't look so good. On my computer it looks fairly decent. So I'm going to go ahead and say OK for right now. And we get the end result. It's amazing the difference on my computer versus your computer. Uh, so now that I've, I've, I've gotten there, I'm going to work with this image um, First, I want to explore a little bit about what layer masking is and how it works. Uh, so the first thing that I'll do is I'll work through my, um, my basic adjustments. And we've been doing this uh, all the way along. So I can go, for example, to Layer, New Adjustment Layer, and I can do a Levels Adjustment, for example. And I'll say OK. And we'll have a look. Oh, actually, it looks like my levels are pretty good. Maybe I'll tweak that down a little bit. So that didn't help too much. Let me go ahead and do another adjustment. And I'm going to do this one not because I think it's the best choice, but because it will illustrate what I'm trying to show you a lot better. So what I'll do here is I'm going to go into New Adjustment Layer, and I'm going to go to my Channel Mixer. And I'm going to check the box for Monochrome. Yeah, something like that. And I'll go ahead and, and leave that. So right now my image is black and white. And you could do this with other examples, and I'll show you this with other, uh, with other examples. But this is the easiest for you to see on the projector. So that's why I'm using it as my example. If I look at the adjustment layer, I have the adjustment. I have a little chain lock thing, and then I have a white square. And you've probably already noticed this before, where I have this white square. Okay? The white square here, as the second object, represents something called a mask. And a mask is essentially. Um, if, if, like, um, let's see, if I were going to spray paint on a wall, not that you would go do that, and before I spray painted, I put a piece of masking tape on the wall. 
And then I spray painted the wall and I peeled off the masking tape. The part that had the masking tape on it obviously wouldn't have the spray paint on it. Right? Make sense? So what I can do on this white box is if I paint black on it in some place, it's essentially like putting masking tape and saying don't apply what I did. So in this case, I'm going to make sure that this is highlighted. And it takes a little bit of, of getting your head around this. So we'll, we'll practice a lot today with it. Essentially, what I'll do is I'll make sure that the mask is selected. So this white square is selected. You see how I have the little white brackets around it. I'll come over to my paintbrush tool, which is right here. And I'm going to pick under the size here. I'm going to pick a larger brush, a little bit bigger, something like that. And I want it to be nice and hard in this context. I put hardness at 100% because I want to be able to show you the contrast. So with that, my paint color is black down here. If your paint color is not black, if you click on the square that is on top, you can then specify that, no, I want black as my color. And now, if I start to paint, it's as if I'm putting masking tape down. And lo and behold, the color comes back. So what this is doing is it's saying, wherever I paint, don't let this adjustment apply. So I could, for example, paint my way along the edge of the sky. Now that I'm there, I'm going to use the bracket key. It's the shortcut for making my brush bigger. And we'll paint in the rest of this like that. And so essentially, this black and white mask is only applying to the bottom half of the image, not the sky. So I can selectively control what parts of, of the image have something specific applied to them. So let me flip over in another example here. And I'm going to work with just the sky in this example. So let me go into my uh, layer, new adjustment layer. I'm going to go to Curves. And I'll say OK. And as I make these adjustments to the curves, the only thing I really care about is what the sky looks like. So maybe I want a little bit more clouds in the sky, something like that, so I can see more of the clouds. I don't want this adjustment to apply to the mountains at all. I just want it to the clouds. So once again, I'll use my mask over here on my curves layer. That mask is selected. Black is selected as my paint. My brush is here. It's set at 500. And I'm going to paint the rest of this image. so that my curves adjustment no longer applies to it. And you guys can still see it a little bit, right? Let me do, uh, maybe I need to do a levels adjustment so you guys can see this a little bit better. Just finish here. It looks fine on my screen, but you guys are having trouble seeing it on that screen. Let me see if I can brighten up the whole image so you can see it a little bit better. Too light on my screen, too, it'll be too light on the recording, but you guys can see it better on the projector screen. Now, as I look at this, my curves adjustment here, I have to be a little bit careful against the, the, the horizon here, against the top, because you see how I get that halo that's happening. So let me make my brush a little bit smaller. I use the bracket key to do that. And I need to come in here. Oops, sorry, wrong. I have to be on this mask. And I'll come in here, and I'll fine tune where it's applying. And I might even control plus zooms in, space bar pans, and I might need to get a little bit closer. And work my way that way. Uh, that's another option. I could use the magic wand to try to select the sky. It's easier to select the sky than the rock. Do a select inverse. And I could paint along there. In this case, it's giving me a little bit of a halo right along the edge. So you have to be a little careful. Um, we'll deal with Magic Wand selections next class. Um, the point is you have to spend a little bit of time actually kind of working through this a little bit. Um, but notice that my adjustment, or my curves adjustment, is only applying to the sky. So I can do the same thing in a variety of ways. I can adjust levels and have it apply to a specific part of the image. So as as you continue through part one with your image, I want you to play around with this concept of masking. So even if 
you convert part of the image to black and white and part of it to color. If you understand the concept of masking, no matter how it looks, I'm happy. Even if you made something look weird, that's OK. So we can do other things. You can, you can play around with other adjustment layers. I could, for example, let me go back to this one. I could go into new adjustment layer. I could go into, let me go into my color balance here. And in this context, I could, I could switch the whole image to a different color, for example, if I wanted to. And, and control, oh, I only want the, let me, let me make it blue. Let me make it blue. OK, but I only want it to apply to the lake itself. So I'll use the mask. There's my paintbrush in black. And I'll paint out everything else. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so it goes faster. OK, so that's a good question. So in this context, I've been working on it, and I made a mistake. Right? I, didn't, I didn't cut in close enough there. So what I'm going to do, instead of undoing, I'm actually going to flip my black and my white colors. So remember over here that the things that are black are like masking tape, don't apply. Things that are white apply. So I can actually flip my colors and paint back in with white to get more of what was cut off. And then I can flip my colors again. There's a little double-sided arrow that lets me flip my colors. And I could cut in along there a little bit better. I can make this a little bit smaller. Flip my colors. And we could paint that piece back in. Flip my colors. Touch up right there along the edge. Touch up right there. Is this really the, the ideal thing to do? No. Is it making the image look better? No, not particularly. But I want today for you to learn masking. And so however the image looks, I'm happy. It's about the masking. It's about the processing. Okay? In an ideal world, you'd process it so that it looks perfect. All right? But anyway, you get the idea of, of what we can do here with the masking. So I've done masking on these two as an example. I want you to play around with that. You can obviously do blending modes as well. If we did a blending mode, even if we duplicated this layer, let me turn off these for just a second, and we applied a blending mode to this, if I did an overlay, for example, I don't know that that is necessarily the best strategy. Let me do a, a lighten and see if that, yeah, maybe like that. I can still apply a mask to that. Notice that it doesn't have the chain and the white square yet. I have to actually add it. I can come down here to this button here, which is Add Layer Mask. It's the rectangle with the circle in it. Now I have a white square next to it, and I can do the same painting to have something apply or not apply. And so, black means apply, and black doesn't match up. Right, black means don't apply. White means apply. Okay. Everything that I've done in this is black or white with sharp edges. If I use gray, for example, It'll half apply and half not apply. Furthermore, if I switched my brush, let me, let me turn this off and go back to this example because it's really easy for you to see. If I switched my brush and instead of having 100% hard, which gives me a soft, uh, with, which gives me a hard edge, I went to 100% soft. Hold on, let me make sure I'm on the layer here. Let me zoom in. It's going to create a blurry edge along there, as opposed to having the sharp edge. So see how that's sharp? And now it kind of fades. It, uh, your, your opacity, yes, your opacity would apply. Mm -hmm. that, would, that would soften the effect as well. So you may end up deciding that you want to do a little bit of that. And a lot of this work takes zooming in and actually working pixel by pixel through, through the image, which obviously takes some time. So I want you to play around with that and start to be comfortable with masking. We will use masking a lot in this class going forward. So it's, it's really an important concept for you to, to understand and get. Today's the easy day of playing around with it. When we move into next class, it'll start to be important that you understand what a mask is and how we're using it uh, in a little bit more depth. So let me move on to part two. When you're done with your image, you need to do a file, save for web. That's the version that you'll post. That's a JPEG. 
you'll also do a save as to save your Photoshop file in case you wanted to go back and edit it later on. So when we get to the panoramic images, I'm going to, I'd already downloaded the different sets of panoramas. Let me show you these uh, live. Not all of them work, but um, let's see. We can see the, the first one here. It's one of the, the, the actual where you can, you can swing through and see. Um, this, I didn't shoot the full 360. There's a little hole at the bottom. There's a little hole at the top. I got lazy. Yeah. Um, and so anyway, but you can, you can look around and you can see what that one looks like. I have that set of images for you there. This set here is that one I showed you in lecture a little bit ago that's inside the building. So you can look through. This one is a full 360. If you look straight down, right, we see all the dirt and everything that's below. And if we look straight up, we see the, the top of the sky. So it does work as a full 360. All the images are there for you as well. And I think this last one here is, is shot outside in the courtyard. And I don't have that one as a sample, so you can't see that one. Uh, but it's of the ET building. You can choose any one of those three to play around with. You'll want to download those files and unzip them or decompress them uh, as necessary. And if you actually look at them, let me look at this one, for example, you can see that there's a bunch of images that go into making up this, this panorama. And just say no thanks. I probably did it as a Dropbox because they're large files. And I didn't actually confirm that they download. <laughs> Yeah, you should be direct download there. There we go. OK, it is downloading. Good. Just making sure. Um, so when you go to actually put these together in Photoshop, we're once again going to open up Photoshop. I'm going to go to File. I'm going to again go to the Automate. So last time, we went to Merge to HDR Pro. We're going to go one more down to Photo Merge. And we then get the Photo Merge dialog box. This, by the way, is written out in Photoshop 1.7 panoramas. So it's, it's there for you. I, I prefer to leave the layout set to auto, let Photoshop figure it out for you. We need to go browse our files. So I'm going to go click on Browse. Now, like I said, if we dump the entire set of images in, into Photoshop, it's not going to do a good job. And it's going to take a long time. And you'll see it, the results aren't that, aren't that good. You're more than welcome, of course, to try it out if you want to. See if you can crash Photoshop. But save your other work first. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a few of these images. I'll take the first three, maybe four images. And I'm going to scroll down here. And I'll take, notice that I started with the door so that I knew where the door was. Let's take some upper images with the door, a few more. That. Let's come over here. Now, there's the lower version of the door. I'll take four there. Wait, I selected too many. Hold on, let me go back. I have to hold down Control. Sorry. Let's take this, 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 and this. This, 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 and this. So I'm taking maybe 12 images total. And I'll go ahead and say OK. And I get my 12 images. I do want to blend the images together. I'm not so worried about vignette removal. Uh, if I were taking the image and the, the edges of the image were dark, vignette removal is essentially remove that dark edge. The, in this case, there really aren't anything. I'm going to go ahead and say OK at that, this point. And we're going to let Photoshop do its magic. And so this process is going to take a little bit longer than the merge to HDR. But it's also a good way of seeing how Photoshop deals with masking. So we'll let it, it's, it's loaded up the 12 images. Now it's attempting to look through the images and align them based on stuff that's in both sets of images. Lots of, uh, the most important thing is lots of overlap. So if you only took three, give it a shot and see what happens. It depends how much overlap they have. OK. So Photoshop finished up, and it gave me a blend of all these images. Notice, of course, that it warped it out a bit. 
the straight wall becomes a curved wall. Um, and in this process, it opened up all 12 of my images, and then it carefully controlled which parts of a particular image are shown. So let me turn all of these off for just a second. And I'm going to start with Now let's start with the image with the door. So there's the image. That's the first image. What Photoshop did is it warped the image a bit. And you can see that it warped that image a little bit. And it aligned this image with the image that was next door. So let me turn the image that was next door on um, so you can see it. So there's the image that was next door. Notice that each one of these has been warped in a similar manner. Okay? So there's that and there's that. And they align over each other. But if I were looking closely at these images, they're close, but they're not quite perfect. So what Photoshop does is it also, not only does it warp the two images, it also puts a mask on each image, the same way we were just doing in the HDR. So if I right click, I'm enabling these two masks to see what it's done. It's essentially, it's cut out a bunch of the pieces of this image such that these two images fit almost seamlessly together. That's the only little bit that it's using from one image. Let me continue on down and turn on this image. So we have just a tiny bit from that image, a lot from this image, but it's causing these rocks to all blend together really nicely. As I continue coming down, there's that piece. So this particular image up here, if I were looking at the whole image, it's warped rather severely. Turn them all off there. Compared to the, the, the image that was straight across. But the only piece that I'm using of it is this, this piece right there. So Photoshop works hard to blend these two pieces together such that they look seamless right there. Okay, And it does that masking for us. All of this is done with the masks. So if I turn on the whole image, you can see as I look down the mask, it's using just pieces of these image, images to make them seem seamless. Does that kind of make sense, how it works? So what I want you to do for this is I want you to you know, pick an, a group of images, maybe 12 images or so, uh, and try to stitch them together if you can. Um, do a save for web. If you want to do some adjustments on this image, by all means, do some adjustments on this image as well. So do a levels adjustment or whatever as appropriate. I want you to post both the panorama image, this one, and the um, HDR image that you do to the course website. And if you have any extra time, start browsing through and getting ideas for your assignment 102 for what's coming. Remember, you can always look at previous student work if you go to the course website, go to student work, if we go into assignments, we're looking at assignment 102. And so you can scroll through and see what other people um, have done in the past. Give it a little time to load. Anyway, I don't know why it's not more of a Martin loading. But you can go through and, and see what those various um, previous examples might be. There we go. We're starting to load up now. Anyway, you get the idea. So spend a little bit of time doing that. Are there any questions about masking? No? OK. So why don't you guys give it a shot uh, and let me know if you have any trouble.